Good morning. If you're happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning, say amen. Well, me too. A little tired, but a great day. Maybe some of you feel the same way. Sometimes it's, uh, it may take a little bit longer to get out of bed and, and to get things warmed up, but what a joyous day God's given us, and it's good to be together this morning. Uh, we're we're uh, in for a real treat today on so many different levels. It's great to have my mom playing, and and uh, my father-in-law speaking today, and uh, it's just a great day. And people who've come for uh, the wedding uh, that was yesterday, we had a little wedding in our family uh, yesterday, So um, and, and the happy couple is on their way to their honeymoon. So, yeah, how cool is that? How cool is that? Um, how many of you have ever noticed that you don't notice everything? Have you caught this? Sometimes things can be right in front of us, and we just don't see it. And, um, and maybe there's more around us on any given day than we could ever realize. Lord, as we gather to worship this morning, we pray that we would see you. That we would see glimpses of heaven even as we worship together. As we lay aside the things that entangle us, as we lay aside the things that get in the way and we just enjoy one another's company, but even more so as we enjoy your presence in this room. Give us eyes to see, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you stand? Let's worship the Lord this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Will you join with me in the morning prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, but you have invited us into a relationship through your Son, Jesus Christ. Because of your immense love for us, you've invited us to cast all our cares on you. Today we give you our lives in total, the good, bad, and ugly. We give you all of us that you might give us all of you. 
Renew our hearts today and renew our minds. Help us to see the needs around us and respond with compassion, grace, and love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You know those moments when we, um, at least for me, uh, I used to print at the bottom of the uh, bulletin, you know, Lord, may something happen today that's not printed in the bulletin. Uh, because uh, sometimes we get so keyed into the bulletin, we simply go through and check it off as we go along. Uh, may that not be true today. <laughs> uh, the anthem, so to speak, will be an anthem of prayer. And I've asked Mom if she'd play something, and she's going to play something. And, and I just thought maybe we'd carve out a little bit of time. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And maybe it's something that was wiggled loose during the congregational prayer. Or maybe it's something that you've brought into worship today that's weighing heavy on your heart. Or maybe it is a joy that is welling up on the inside of you like a wellspring. If you want to come down and, and kneel as you pray, you're welcome to do that. Uh, or stay where you're seated. But as mom plays, let's just come before the Lord and invite God uh, into this space as we continue. Our gracious and loving God, we're so thankful for the gift of being together and the gift of your presence. God, we thank you for this church and for the privilege of being here together this morning. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. God, we thank you that you've invited us to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us so deeply. God, You know every person in this room. You know everything that makes us who we are. You know all the gifts and the graces that You've given us. You know all of our successes and triumphs 
and you know all of our failures and shortcomings. And you love us so deeply. Lord, we're thankful for that today. God, we pray that you would continue to lead each one of us and guide each one of us. We know that we set out to live each day for you, and sometimes we forget. Sometimes we miss what's right in front of us. Sometimes we miss opportunities, and sometimes we miss evidences of your presence with us. God, in these moments, we hit the pause button of our lives to say how much we love you. And we invite your Holy Spirit to continue to do a work on each one of us, making us more like Christ. Lord, I pray for every person here who is carrying a heavy load today. Maybe so heavy they can't budget. Lord, would you lift the burden? Would you remind them that they're not alone? Would you send your comforter to come alongside and remind them of your presence. God, we pray for those who have been ill and sick and in the hospital, those who are still in the hospital and receiving care. God, for each one, we pray that you would stretch out your healing hand over their lives and restore health. We pray that you would continue to give doctors and nursing staff wisdom and guidance as they care for their patients. Lord, we pray for our government, our state government, our federal government, and governments all around this world. We pray that you would give leaders wisdom as they lead us. And not to seek the best for themselves, but to seek the best for the world. And Lord, once again, we thank you that we can place our lives in your hands. And we pray that you would continue to perfect us in faith, even as we pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the the second change that we're going to do today is that there won't be a children's time, (laughs) but we are going to sing. And so I want to invite us, we're going to sing, we bring a sacrifice of praise. Let's sing through it twice and, and let's just worship as we sing this. Well, I want to invite our ushers, if they would prepare to receive the morning offering. You know, every week we have an opportunity to worship God through the giving of our tithes and gifts and offerings. 
Uh, if you've already filled out your Making Connection card, uh, letting us know that you're here today, you can put this in the offering plate uh, as it comes by. Uh, if you're new with us today, uh, please don't feel any sense of obligation. You can let that plate go right on by. Uh, but for those of us that call this our church home, this is where we invest in the work that God is doing in and through Wesley. So may God bless you as we bring our tithes, gifts, and offerings to God. Gracious God, we are so thankful for all that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for entrusting us to be stewards of what is yours. And we bring these gifts before you today and ask that you would use them for the furthering of your kingdom on this earth. Continue to use us and our gifts to build your kingdom for the sake of Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to hear the, the word today, um, I want to invite us to sing through the chorus of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. my privilege to introduce um, our speaker today, uh, because first of all, he's my father-in-law, uh, but he's quite a guy as well, a World War II vet, 
um, a pastor who's the president of a seminary that he started in Portugal, a missionary, uh, a police commissioner of Western Springs, Illinois, a Bible scholar, uh, and just um, has probably lived more in one lifetime than I can live in two. Uh, but Art, would you come? I know you. God's given you a word. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce my father-in-law, Art Brown. <laughs> It's always a happy experience for us to visit Charleston and Wesley Methodist Church, and I continually more and more recognize some of these beautiful faces that are sitting here this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being with you. Uh, it was suggested that I say something about the Bible this morning, and I'm delighted to do that because as an avid reader all of my life, it is the most unique book I've ever held in my hand. The Bible is unique for a number of reasons. If you go on Wikipedia and look up the Bible, you'll discover that an estimated six billion copies of the Bible have been published. That's a humongous number. If you pile them one on top of the other out here in the parking lot, they go all the way past the moon. This is a huge and it's been translated, the full Bible, in 531 languages, plus portions of the Bible in another 2,800 languages and dialects. With that formidable number of publication, translation, distribution, it makes the Bible the most unique book that's ever appeared on this globe. No other book has this phenomenal publication the Bible is also unique for a number of reasons. Another reason is uh, if you walk into any great library here in the United States, you will find at least two dozen books that note and trace the influence of the Bible on cultures all over the world, all over the world. But especially here in Western culture, we can't imagine art, music, education, science, government, democracy, human rights, egalitarianism, the questions of the ethicists, what's right, what's wrong, the questions of the philosophers, why are we here, what's our purpose in life, and on and on and on. The influence of the Bible is greater upon all of humanity than any other book ever written. I'm trying to suggest the Bible's important, that it's an unusual book. There, there's one more reason that I want to suggest. There are many. Of all the books in the world, and by the way, the Bible is not a book. It's a whole library. 66 pieces of literature from history to poetry to prophecy to gospels to, to letters to apocalypse, written by more than 40 authors over a period of more than a thousand years. No book in the world has this kind of diversity. No book. But its influence is immeasurable. And yet, the Bible is consistent through all that diversity of authorship and all that long period of time with one major theme. And it is unwavering from Genesis to Revelation. One basic theme. It's been called the story of redemption. It's about two characters, the whole Bible. The first character is mentioned in the very first line. In the beginning, God. There's your main character in the Bible. Unseen, but revealing himself all the way through Scripture, sometimes subtly, sometimes dramatically, like at the burning bush until you get to the New Testament. And all the Old Testament has been predicting something that's going to happen in this theme of salvation, of redemption. And finally you come to Jesus. There he stood before his disciples one day, and one of them said, Ah, oh, Master, show us God, and we'll believe. Sounds like one of us, doesn't it? We're so arrogant. 
And Jesus responded, the one who has seen me has seen God. Amazing. I'm what God is like. You look at me. If you ever have any questions about God, go to Jesus. Look at Jesus. And then he did more in Revelation. He hung on a cross. And the Apostle Paul said simply, Christ died for our sins. And then the Hebrews writer exclaims, We enjoy such a, and these are his words, a so great salvation. There's excitement all the way through the scriptures on the part of God. But now, Genesis also says that God made man and woman in his own image, in his own likeness. This is an incredible endowment. What does it mean? It means we can have a very intimate connection with God. A personal relationship with God. A friendship with God. We're made like Him so that we're on the same page. And yet the rest of the history of this second group of characters is interesting. It's up and down all the way through the Scripture. But it's a story of redemption. Uh, I have lived and worked in countries all around the world. I've met people in China and Taiwan and Japan and Australia and India and North Africa and, of course, all over Europe where I live. <clears throat> and I've heard people say over and over again something like this, the Bible is the greatest treasure I have. Why? Because it was instrumental in the transformation of their personal lives and even communities all around the world. And yet in America, in the last couple of decades, We've begun to ignore the Bible so that uh, the Pew Research Center has said America today is a biblically illiterate country. Amazing. What have we done? What have we done? What have we lost? What treasure have we lost? And that's a valid question. Now, I've said something about the Bible. I would like to take us into the Bible for a few moments and consider one line, one line. Oh, what a magnificent statement it is, however. It's right there in the middle of the Bible, Psalm 103, verse 1. Only 15 words, but it's written by a poet, the best-known poet in all of human history. His name was David. Why is he best known? Well, people repeat Psalm 23. The Lord is my ship. This poem of David, millions of people repeat this, if not every day, every week, around the world. No poet in all of human history has been recited as much as David. Now, he composed this little line. Can we have it on the screen, Jim? There it is. Would you read it with me? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Do you recognize that as poetry? Probably not. Hebrew poetry is different than Western poetry. Our poetry has meter, rhyme very often, most often. That's not true of Hebrew poetry. Oh, Hebrew poetry has rhythm, but it doesn't have rhyme. Actually, I should say this about Hebrew poetry. But first, you know what prose is? You all know what prose is. Prose, we sometimes say, is the language of the mind. It's about information, prose is, declaration, communication, most often about facts. That's not true of poetry. Poetry is quite different. Poetry is the language of the heart, not the mind. It's not about facts. It's about feelings. About meaning, deep meaning. Sometimes in figures of speech, poets usually do this. So that you have to dig to understand what the poet is saying. But it's also about experience. And biblical poetry is about experiencing something. 
It's not about reading that. A lot of people read the Bible and the poetry in the Bible, and they never got it. Never got it. Poetry. Do you know that one third of the Old Testament is poetry? Some people say much more, and probably is much more. Nineteen of the 39 books are almost complete poetry. Not just Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many of the prophets that follow. That's almost half the Old Testament books are poetry. Genesis 1 is poetry. Did you know that? There are a couple of groups that argue that it's prose. Why? Because they have a position. That the, this is a scientific document on how God created the world. It is not. It's poetry. It was written by a poetry, and the theme is not creation at all. Oh, creation, sir. But the theme is in the beginning. That's the theme. It's all about God. What God observed, what God saw, what God thought, what God planned, what he proposed, what God created, what God made, how God evaluated it, about God's feelings about all that he did. He said, it is very good. And you get to the end of the poem, and the poet's concern is not that you get informed, but that you say, wow, is God ever awesome. What a ingenious creator is God. You see, the poet's intent is not your mind, it's your heart, it's your feelings. He wants you to be amazed, to experience something. And this is true of all the poetry in the Old Testament. Oh, there's poetry in Exodus, and Leviticus, there's poetry in Deuteronomy, there's poetry in the Gospels. Jesus was a poet. You, you repeat the Beatitudes, that's poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. There's poetry in all, almost all of Paul's letters. Revelation is filled with poetry. You're supposed to feel something rather than learn something. And it's true of this statement. This is David. To whom is he speaking? He's not speaking to you or me. This is challenging self-talk. Self-talk is what goes on in your head all day long. This is challenging self-talk. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all of his needs. Bless his holy name. Now, this is characteristic of Hebrew poetry. Not rhyme and rhythm or meter, but parallelism. The poet says one thing in one line, and then he says the same thing, but with different words in the second line. Example, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, Second line, and the skies show his handiwork. So it means the same thing. You and I have to dig a little bit, even in that, to discover what the poet is saying. And then to feel something. If you don't feel something, you didn't get it. If we don't feel something here, we don't get it. Do you see the parallelism? Bless the Lord. By the way, uh, we... We, we do what we do with symphonies. We analyze symphonies, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, and so on. And, and in analyzing, we have theme A, then theme B. Da-da-da-da-da. That could be theme A. Da-da-da-da-da, theme B. Then we go back to A. Da-da-da-da-da. Back to B. Da-da-da-da-da. Then we go through all variations through the symphony, and we get to the end. Back again. Da-da-da-da-da. A. Da-da-da-da-da. B. A. B. And then a dramatic coda, perhaps. Now, we take that example. A, bless the Lord. B, O, my soul. Now, David usually does A, B, A, B. But up here he does A, B, and he repeats. O, my soul, and all that is within me. Do you see that those are parallel? My soul in me. Same parallel. And then he returns to A. Bless his holy name. So I've, we've had it invented, so it stands out. But it doesn't stand out in your Bible. You and I are supposed to recognize 
the structure of Hebrew poetry. Is that important? The poet chose it so that we could understand what he's saying. Well, there it is. Let me unpack just for a few moments. Bless the Lord. That's female. What does it mean to bless the Lord? We know how the Lord blesses us. Do you, uh, we didn't sing the third stanza of that greatest high faithful, but the poet's lyricist says, Pardon for sin, and the peace that endures, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beasts. You and I are blessed every second of every day. The breath you breathe, the beating of your heart, everything you see, the colors, the food you take, everything. We are blessed. What is a blessing a gift? These are gifts from God. But how can I give those things to God? I can't pardon God. I can't give Him peace. I can't give Him guidance, strength for today. I can't give that to God. Hope for tomorrow. I, those are not gifts I can give to God. You say, well, I can give money. I can give service. Well, yes, you can. But that's not what David's talking about. David is not talking about what you do or what you give, but something that comes out of the very center of your life, the depths of your being. It only comes out of you. It doesn't come from anything else. Bless the Lord. I could go through a whole number of synonyms of what that word bless means. For example, in Psalm 100, three psalms before this, notice the A, B, A, B parallelism. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. B, and his courts with praise. Back to A, be thankful unto him and bless his name. So all the praise to God that I can give to him as a gift. I do this consciously, intentionally, as a gift to him. Thanksgiving for all he's done for me. Praise for who he is and what he means to me. There are two synonyms. I like to go to Psalm 66, the first verse. This is David again. He says, sing unto the Lord a new song. That doesn't mean one that hasn't been written yet. That means it comes out of you fresh and new and living and exciting. And Paul reflects this writing to the Colossians. He says, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Now that suggests it may be inaudible, but you could do it out loud around the kitchen or, or your home or driving down the road. You could do this every day, sing to the Lord. Do you ever sing to the Lord? I go out to do my two miles each day, and I'm singing inside of me. You know, usually, how great thou art, or some song I'm talking, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own, that old chorus. And I'm singing inside, oh, those two miles are great for me. <laughs> Do you sing to the Lord? We sang the hymn, Greatest I Faithful. Did we sing it to hear our own voices? Or just because it's in the program? Or did you intentionally, very consciously, say in your son, Lord, I'm giving you a gift. I'm singing to you. I've discovered people sit in, sit in congregations and churches all over and they have no sense of directing this as a conversation, a prayer, a praise, a gratitude to God. So every time you come to a hymn, whether it's this one or How Great Thou Art, or any of the hymns that's direct address, you say to the Lord, Lord, I'm singing this to you, even if I'm in church surrounded by people. I'm singing this to you. This is my gift to you. See, a blessing is a gift. It's something you really give to God every day of your life and all through the day. And then the psalmist says in 66, And say to the Lord, How awesome are your deeds. You talk to the Lord through the day. It's your greatest friend. So you thank the Lord. You praise the Lord. You talk to the Lord. You sing to the Lord. I like Isaiah 61.10. Notice the parallelism again. Isaiah says, I delight greatly in the Lord. And then the next line means the same thing. My soul rejoices in my God, 
And Paul picks that up and he says to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say it. Do it always. Do it every day. Do it through the day. Now, there's a sense in which all of Hebrew poetry, and particularly the Psalms, they call us to live with God, to be conscious of God. After all, the greatest promise in all of Scripture is, I'm with you always. The greatest promise you ever hear. I'm with you always. And so we live with God. And all of these synonyms are all gathered together and captured in this one remarkable word, bless. Now, some of you heard, uh, remember the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven? Remember how it begins? The orchestra just thunders. Da-da-da-da! They hold that, and then there's a pause. Why does Beethoven do that? Well, he wants to shock you. He wants to surprise you. He wants you to just sit up with your wise, eyes wide open. This is David's da-da-da-da. And we never say it. Bless the Lord. It's a da-da-da-da. It's, it's an imperative. It's an active verb. Sentences don't begin with verbs, but this one does. Da-da-da-da. Bless the Lord. And look at that B. Oh, my soul. Not Bless the Lord, my soul. Oh, my soul. It's as if David is pleading with himself to do something that he hasn't been doing, that he hasn't done well, and he knows he's failed here. You see that? By the way, David's psalms are usually about himself. And he puts it into poetry, so if you're going to read it, you have to identify with David. You have to feel what David is feeling. If you don't feel it, you don't get it. All you did was read words. Oh, my soul. In fact, the next line in that psalm says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his glad benefits, his blessings. And David's thinking, Oh, I'm such a forgetter. And we of all people, on this planet Earth as Americans, we are the greatest forgetters in the world. We take so much for granted every day. You drink a glass of water, you don't even think a thought about it. When there are millions and millions of people that don't have clean water, for example. The simplest things of life. We are blessed, like that hymn said, 10,000 beside. We are blessed. We are so blessed. We take it for granted. I think of Shakespeare's line, and he has King Lear say this, Oh, how sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child. We call ourselves children of God. Are we really grateful? Do we get into that verb, bless the Lord, thanking the Lord, praising the Lord, talking to the Lord, sing to the Lord, excited just because we have this relationship with the Lord. Do we live this way? Well, David feels like the old hymn says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Come thou fount of every blessing, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Now something. You, each one of you, is the greatest preacher you'll ever hear. Not somebody on a stage or a screen. Why? Because when you engage in challenging self-talk, we, we use that phrase a lot today, self-talk, self-talk. Most of it's negative. Self-talk. When we engage in challenging self-talk, at which David was so skilled and Isaiah was so skilled, the biblical people were so skilled in this, challenging themselves. If you challenge yourself, there's a possibility there will be change. Some learning, some growing, some becoming. We don't change because other people tell us to do it. We change because we challenge ourselves. I sat on the couch this week, and I said to myself, Brown, get up and do your two hours. 
60 minutes, 60 seconds later, I was still sitting there. And I said, come on, Brown, get off your dock and get out there. Well, I did my two miles, and I'm singing all the way, and I'm having a wonderful time. And I get back, and I said, why do I have all this resistance to change, to even moving from a position of comfort to something that's challenging? We're like this, but we change when we make new choices ourselves and step out ourselves and sometimes risk something ourselves. Well, there it is. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. And how am I to do that? All that is within me. <laughs> that is, don't bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the food today. Blah, blah, blah. Are we praying? I don't know. Is that insulting? I don't know. Do it with all this. Do it with enthusiasm. Do it with passion. Bless the Lord with everything that is in you. And bless his holy name. If that adds anything to that first line, it's the God's, the holy one, the unique one. He's the sovereign. He's the one that is the source of every blessing we have. He deserves our blessing. Now, conclusion. If I read this, and it's usually read this way by us, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. If David was standing behind the curtain somewhere and heard that, he'd be shaking his head and say, you just don't get it, do you? You don't get it. But if I said it this way, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I think David would smile and be as excited as Rex Harrison, for example, and my fair lady. He said, by George, I think she's got it. I think she's got it. Do you get it? Can you identify with David in his personal experience here? Can you feel what David is feeling? Can you respond as David certainly responded in the rest of that psalm. Much of the Bible is not to be read. If we only do that, we still will not understand. It's when you experience it that we understand. Fighting on the front lines. I was a rifleman in the infantry and Italy and the first, first wave of the invasion of southern France. And I walked most of Italy and most of France up to the German border before hospitalization. But, but in all those months of fighting, dodging bullets, digging foxholes, day after day after day, here I was memorizing the book of Romans. <laughs> and I thought, one thing that scares everybody else to death that's around me and my buddy, we dug parcels together sometimes, like on Anzio Beach. Ed. I thought, you know the thing that's keeping me going and keeping me somewhat sane in the midst of all these artillery barrages, everything bursting around us, is the Word of God. And I call it the Word of God because it is God's special message to me. Live it. Get it. Identify with it. Feel it. Let yourself go as it were. And let it enter your whole being. And Lord, you sit with each one of us here. You stand with me here this morning. You know our hearts and our thoughts. To what degree we have responded to you, inspire each one of us to bless you with all that is in us. And thank you, Lord. Amen. So,
disciples on the first night when Jesus was betrayed. He invited his close friends to an upper room to experience something. They had experienced it before, but this time it was a little different. Because Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks for it. He gave thanks for bread because there was a prayer before bread and there was a prayer before wine. And they recited it every time. But this time, it was a little different. Because after Jesus gave thanks for the bread, he broke it. And he said to them, This is my body, which is broken for you. So take and eat this. And as often as you eat this bread, remember me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and He gave thanks for it, which was His custom. But this time, He said, This is My blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. So take and drink, all of you. And as often as you drink it, remember Me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we're really participating, experiencing the Lord. And in a beautiful way, we are participating in the life and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The bread representing everything that Jesus did in the flesh. And the the juice, the the, the wine representing every, all the, the Spirit of God that animated Jesus' life. So when we participate in these elements, we're participating in the living Christ. So Lord, would You pour out Your Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be for the world around us the body of Christ redeemed, alive, hands and feet. We pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. I want to invite those that are going to help serve communion to come forward. And as they're doing that, I just want to offer up uh, some words of instruction on how we will receive. Uh, We'll have, um, we might have four stations, uh, one here, two in the middle, and one over there. I believe that station over there is uh, gluten-free. So if you prefer gluten-free elements, please go to that, uh, that aisle on, the, on my far left, your far right. Um, but we will receive by intinction. So when you come forward, you'll get a little piece of bread and dip a corner of that piece of bread into the cup and in essence taking both the elements simultaneously. And after you've received the elements, if you'd like to spend some time in prayer at the altar, well, you're welcome to do that. Um, also know that uh, we practice what's called open communion which means we don't see this as a Methodist table. We see this as the Lord's table. And please know that despite your, uh, if if there are different denominational backgrounds here, um, please know that you're welcome to receive the elements uh, with us today. If for some reason, according to your um, tradition, if you're not allowed to receive the elements, would you come to where I'm standing and just cross your arms and I'll pray a blessing over you uh, and, and would love to be able to. But this is God's gift to you. It is free for you. And if your desire today is to be uh, in, a, in a growing, deeper relationship with God, then you come forward and you receive these elements, God's gift. You come as your man.
thank you for this holy mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. We pray that even as these physical elements become part of our physical bodies, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would nourish our souls and we would become more like Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Before we um, close the service, is it time for announcements? Is that what your bulletin says? I don't have mine. Um, first of all, my name's Bob Swickard and the pastor here, and, and I just want you to know how glad we are that you're here in worship today. It's a great day uh, to be here together. So welcome uh, to this place. Um, if you uh, do, we have a Stephen Ministry announcement, Nancy. Well, yeah, I can. I, I just want you to notice that um, the last couple of weeks, uh, Nancy Marlowe has been talking about the Stephen Ministry. And Stephen Ministry, you have an announcement in your bulletin about the Stephen Ministry. It's really an opportunity for someone to come up alongside someone else for a time to go through life together. And maybe uh, you're at a point in your life where um, you would like to have someone do that with you because you're going through a particularly difficult time. And if you call Nancy, she would be more than happy that to, to help you in that process. But maybe some of you are here today and you, you think, you know what, um, that sounds like something that I could do, uh, given, you know, some more training. Uh, and Nancy can help you do that as well. Um, to be the person that comes alongside someone else to walk with them through a difficult time. So take a look at that announcement um, about Stephen Ministry and, um, and pray about that. And see if God might be leading you uh, to, to walk into Stephen Ministry as well. Um, there are uh, other things uh, after in between services starting at 950. Um, my father-in-law is going to be in this room. And uh, just to have a Q&A time to talk more about uh, the Bible as literature and, and how it's put together and things like that. If you have burning questions about that, I hope that you'll spend some time in here uh, with us in between services starting at 950. And um, also the uh, mission, oh, tonight is the, um, you'll see the announcement for the swim party. It's an all-church swim party uh, out at Rotary Pool, so you'll notice that uh, announcement as well. And that's happening uh, tonight. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to have a backpack blessing for kids as they go back to school. So if you have kids or grandkids uh, that are going back to school, have them bring their backpack with them to church. And, uh, and we're just going to have a blessing of the kids uh, and we're calling it a backpack, backpack blessing. Uh, so that's going to be next week as well. And, um, oh, and lastly, just on a personal note, uh, for all of you that helped us um, get ready for a big wedding that we had yesterday, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the help that you all did uh, to help us get ready. It was a, it was a big deal, uh, obviously, for us. And uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you that helped us with food and stuff. So thanks for doing that. Well, let's... Um, those are all the announcements. There's many more in your bulletin. Make sure you look at those. But let's close uh, as we sing our closing song, Standing on the Throne. Would you stand? You can't stand. Standing on the Throne.
Are we standing on the promises or sitting on the premises? That was a question once posed to me. I've always found that fun. Or that sometimes, if we're real honest, we say, I surrender some. But we can sing, I surrender all. And we're standing on the promises of God. As you go from this place today, may God continue to bless you. May God continue to fill you to the overflowing so that the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ well up within you and flow out from you to those around you that you would be a blessing wherever you go in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Have a great week.